Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It is two o'clock. Well, yeah, two o'clock on the dot. And uh, we're about to start our afternoon nexus with a particular focus on the Greater Cape Town, Boerland, Helderberg, Overberg, and West Coast area. If you can hear me, drop a good afternoon in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And let me greet everyone while we give some people a chance to join. Hello to Feline and Dion. Nice to see you guys again. Lisa Marie, hello Udo. I hope you get your camera thing sorted out. It'd be really nice to see who I'm sitting at a table with. Hello, Melissa. Hello, Martin Yobar. Hello, hello, Terry, Paul, Lorraine. Uh, I think that's your head. Yeah. Hi, your head. I hope you're well. Natalie, Janine van der Heerfer, Naomi, hello, hello Dylan, hello Marie Smith, I see you Jan, hi Deirdre, hi Jill, good afternoon everyone and welcome, howdy ma'am, Paul Ferns, thank you for that, uh, hello Martin, I think I said hello to you before and I see you Susan, hi Terry King, hi Louise, hi Kerry, hello Carl van der Berg, hello Hilda, Hello, Dylan. Hello, Merle. Sure, we are just getting more and more people in this room. Fantastic. Hello, Anna Marie. I see you're joining us from the uh, Chaz Everett and Feldriff. Hello, Arnold. How are you? Okay. I think it's about a minute past, not two minutes past. Let's get cracking. So, good day, everyone, and welcome to the first Nexus of our Greater Cape Town, Boerland, Helderberg, Overberg, and West Coast area. This nexus is brought to you in partnership with our strategic partners, APSA, and also PayProp. I'm Tracy Lee Millen. I'm the brand and marketing executive here at Private Property, and I'm going to be your virtual host for this afternoon's session. So if you don't know what the word nexus means, it's okay, I'm going to tell you. Nexus actually means a series of connections that link two or more things. And in the context of this event, that's exactly what, that, what we are trying to achieve, which is a series of digital connections, digital networking events, which cultivates people connection. And we do that through knowledge sharing and networking. So last year, we tried this Nexus thing out. And it went super, super, super and was very well received by the industry. So we decided we're going to bring it back and make it a bit bigger and better than before. And one way that we've done this is by tailoring the events to specific regions so that the insights that we share within those specific areas are hyper relevant to you and your area, giving you the best possible chance of achieving success in a difficult or tough market. We've got an excellent lineup for you today. So before we get started, let me just take you up, uh, across this platform and introduce you to this platform that we call Remo. It's a very engaging platform. You, many of you already found the chat button there. So I'm going to take you through the other two buttons real quick. In the chat function, you can obviously give us a comment, drop an emoji. In our earlier session, someone dropped a GIF, which was awesome. And um, you can ask questions in this area, in this chat area here. You can say hello to people, like I'm gonna about to say hello to Louise Berger from Acer Fontaine, Brett Spark. I see you there. Thank you for letting me know that you can hear me loud and clear. Right next to the chat button is a participants button. And there you'll be able to literally send an email directly to someone. If there's someone that you've been meaning to connect with, if there's someone that says something in the chat that you need further uh, explanation or description on, you can reach out to them here in the, in the participants box. The box next door is a really awesome um, box. It's called Q&A, obviously for questions and answers. You ask the question here. I'm going to ask you a question. My question is today is special for, for PP why other than the nexus why and again please private property people you're not allowed to answer this question so you can see there tracy lee which is me 
I've just asked the question, today is special for PP. Why? Why is today special? If you know, let me know right here in the general chat. If you like the question, you can upvote the question. Can you see there's already two votes for this question? Click on the Q&A, then you can upvote the question. I see another vote coming in. When it gets to 10 votes, I will give you the answer. Okay, so other than knowing how to engage, I also want you to be aware of the fact that we're going to give out a prize for the most engaged and the best question. So get involved, get active, participate. You know, we don't just want to talk at you. We want to speak with you. We want to engage with you. Last thing I think I should mention before I get our first guest up on the stage here is that we have one and a half non-verifiable CPD points on offer from AISA. All you have to do is stick around until the end of the session and then click on the link to register. Jan, is it the clean Saturday? <laughs> when Jan comes on and does his talk, Right after your hit, he has to tell us exactly what he means by claim Saturday. I see the question. You get to meet me, Paul Ferns. Uh, you get to meet me. Is that do you want us to get to meet you? Find me on the floor and then switch on your camera and then we will we will meet each other there. I think uh, right now, let me ask the very first person that's on our lineup to come onto the stage. Her name is Caroline King, and she is the Head of Sales, Strategy, and Analytics for APSA Bank, our strategic partners. So, Studio, let's get uh, Caroline up on the stage, and I believe, Caroline, you're also going to bring onto the stage um, Dion Van Sale, who will also be um, introducing himself and answering a couple of questions should you have. Uh, let's see, are there any other hellos that I missed? Hi, Keith. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Dion. Oh, uh, Dion, are you the one joining us today, not Caroline? I am, I am the, I am the lucky one that can never be as pretty as Caroline Tracy. Never, never, never. <laughs> well, we are very privileged to have you with us today, <laughs> Dion. And of course, for those who don't know, Dion is the regional manager for home loans at APSA, and he takes care of the greater um, Cape Town region. Dion, take it away. Right, everybody, uh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you for that uh, warm welcome. Um, just, just from my side, it is really a privilege for, for me to be here this afternoon. These Nexus events are absolutely amazing. And thank you for, for private property for, for hosting this. This, this really makes, makes a difference for all of us as, as, as presenters as well. Um, first of all, just a, just a quick... Um, Hi, everyone. I see that uh, Dion is frozen and has no sound, is a little bit silent. Uh, let's give him a minute or two to log back in. I believe that some of us have just been hit by the dread load shedding. Um, there we go, Jan. Thank you for that content. He says, Klein Saturday, the meaning is also known as Wednesday in South Africa. It's the middle of, <laughs> okay, it's kind of the uh, um, a celebration because it's the middle of the weekend, only two days to go before the weekend. Basically, it's just another excuse to have a social and get together or pray in the middle of the week. Thank you for that, Jan. Do I still have you guys in the room? 
Studio, can you tell me in the chat whether we've been able to get um, Mr. Van Sale back? If not, then maybe what we should do is we should go, okay, he's not back in. Can we then go to the Menti questions while we wait for Mr. Van Sale to come back in? Sometimes you just have to work with technology, hey? All right, everyone. So while we wait for Dion to come back, Please take out your cellular phones and go to the website www.menti.com. That's www.menti.com. You will enter a code, which is 45628137, and then enter your name to sign up. I see we've not got anyone yet signed up for Menti. Get to www.menti.com. Enter in the code 45628137. Let's see how many of us are in Menti. I see, I don't see anyone yet, studio. Shall we give it a couple more minutes? All right, there we go. Nick, Natalie, and Melissa, you're in first. We've got Dylan in next. Who else is going to join? Lisa Marie, you are in. Alta, Baedanki, I see you are in. Where are my APSA people? Brett, I see you are in. Thank you, Susan. Estelle, thank you so much for coming in. 10 of you in already. Let's give it a couple more minutes. Come to a website called www.menti.com. Enter in the code 45628137. Yes, we've been doing these, these uh, Nexus events from Monday now. And I really think I'm starting to run out of, uh, out of English. My English is starting to run out. <laughs> Are you in menti.com? Go to put, punch in your name, punch in the code 45628137. I see we've got a nice, nice group of you in here already. Hilda, Louise, I see you. Lynette, I see you. Uh, Jeannie, I see you, Landa, I see Alta, I've already mentioned, Brett, you're in. Okay, excellent. Let's give it maybe one or two more names, uh, studio, and then let's get cracking with that first question. If you're still wondering whether to, you know, participate, you can always join Menti and then punch in the code, enter in your name, studio. Let's move on to the first question. You will see the options for answering on your cell phone, and I and all of us, we will see the responses almost immediately appearing on the screen on, on your desktop. So let's go to the first question, please. Thank you, studio. And the first question is, this is really for us to get to know you and, and know who's in the room here with us. What is your job title or your role within the company today? Are you a CEO, director, executive, franchise owner? Are you a principal agent or a managing broker? Are you an estate agent or an intern? Or are you other? Let's give a few minutes for those responses to come through. Okay, a few more minutes, 23 people answering now. Majority of you in the room are Hi, Yolanda, principal, principal Yolanda Potfisser, I see you. Where are you joining us from, Yolanda? Just drop your area here into the chat. Wonderful, 17 of you in the room saying that you are estate agents or intern estate agents. Wonderful, Yolanda, wonderful to have you with us all the way from Somerset West. Is there anyone that is not from the Greater Cape Town, Boerland, Helderberg, Overberg, or West Coast area? Anyone from anywhere else in the country? Because, of course, with the internet, you can join from when, wherever. On Monday, we actually had someone joining as far, from as far as the UK. Here we go. What type of real estate transactions do you specialize in? This is our second question. Are you focused on sales? Are you focused on rentals? Or do you do both? sales and rentals of course this is a question we're asking every single one of our main uh, nexus sessions so that we can get a good understanding of 
the kind of content we need to put together for rooms such as yours. Okay, wonderful. So a lot of you saying sales and rentals, but definitely the majority of you saying sales. Wonderful. Thank you, Marika. Marika, I see you. Uh, let's get on to the next question, please, studio. Aha, my favorite one. Do you multitask when attending virtual meetings or events online? In fact, I should just ask your head smuts what she's doing right now. Are you multitasking your head? <laughs> I'm kidding. So let's see how many people are honest. Yes, I am guilty would, would be my very first choice because uh, it's difficult not to. Um, uh, your head, I see you, I see you. So yes, I'm guilty of sometimes multitasking. I'll be the first to admit. No one is saying that my mind tends to wander. Three people saying, four people saying I'm 100% focused. We need some of that. We need some of that in a cup and we can all drink it. And then 10 of you saying sometimes. Sometimes you multitask and other times you don't. All right, let's go to the next question, please. Let's make this a good one. In your opinion, is it a buyer or a seller's market? Answer the question and then use the chat to tell me why. Use the chat function to tell me why you think it's a buyer's market or why you think it's a seller's market right now. Someone actually suggested earlier in the week that we add a third option, which says both. Overwhelming majority of you in the room today think that it is a buyer's market. Do you wanna pop your why, why you think it's a buyer's market into the chat perhaps? Okay, let's go into the next question, please, studio. Martin, you're bad saying, thinks it's because of the low interest rates. Agreed. Dante, there's an oversupply of property, making it that way. Is style too much stock in a price range on the market at this time? And you're saying because the, the rates are low. And Merle Nichols, you're saying interest rates. There were a few that said um, sellers. Can you tell me maybe why you suggest it could be sellers? Pop your, pop your um, comments here in the chat and I will read it out loud. Uh, Yolande, thank you so much. You, you're saying buyers because it's of the low interest rate. Here we go. Overseas people cannot come, okay? I see you, Yolanda. And then Paul, you're saying oversupply and interest rate. Okay, the next question. <clears throat> in one word, how would you describe... Oh, let's go back in one word. How would you describe 2021 so far? Not 2020. And let's keep it clean. You know, we need we've, we might have children watching this later. So in one word, how would you describe 2021 so far? The words that appear bigger than the others are words that have been entered more than once. So isn't this lovely to, to see 2021 for so many of you feels great and exciting. The word challenging is also quite visible, good, excellent, life-changing, productive, turbulent. Uh, a couple of days ago, I had a, a, the word crap, <laughs> frustrating, Marika, I see you. Uh, Curtis, you're saying great, Yolande, challenging, and Mo, you're saying busy, very busy. Thank you so much, studio. The big words, they're great, exciting, challenging, good, active, below 3 million, fantastic. And I think this is the very last question, which is a question that, you know, gets a lot of different answers depending on where you're asking the question from. So if you could change one thing in the South African real estate industry right now, what would it be? What would you change if you could change one thing? Remember you... You can think about this a little bit. If you if you want, you, you can give yourself a, a minute or two to think about your about your answer. If you had a genie in a in a lamp, what would you ask the genie to do to change the real estate industry right now? Affordability, getting the EAAB up to date on admin. Um, you, someone is saying nothing. It's interesting times. We're in a never a dull moment. I tend to agree with you there. Um, not, not sure about the nothing part. To have qualified and registered agents. So if you could change that quickly overnight, you would be able, you would do that. 
ethical conduct conduct by state agents and their principals or managers. Obviously, more efficiency in the deeds office. Scroll down for me, please, studio. It would be great to have buyers, a, to have buyers and sellers agents. That would probably create more loyalty from one's clients. Yep, I wonder who said that. That is such, I think that's the very first time I'm seeing that in this section. Be nice to, to delve into that a little bit more. What do we mean by a buyer's and a seller's agent? Deeds office tra trading hours, EAAB system, EAAB agent to be qualified, the deeds office to work more efficiently or effectively, more rental training. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much. This really, really helps us to understand um, what the pain points of, uh, of you in this industry is currently, what your pain points are. Thank you so much, Studio. If you can tell me in the chat whether we have Dion back, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. We, if we have time, we'll do one more Menti a little bit later. Studio, tell me if um, we have Dion back. Okay, fantastic. We're moving to PayProp. All right, so your head, your head smuts is joining us from PayProp. We'll get to Dion after the PayProp session. Your head, of course, is the head of data and analytics in at, at the company called PayProp. And she's joined by the CEO of PayProp, Jan Davel, and together, they are going to take us through the 2020 rental market in review and what the future holds. They'll also give us a sneak peek at the PayProps state of the rental market survey results before they release next quarter. We are indeed very, very um, privileged. Thank you, your head. Over. Thank you, Tracy, and thanks for everyone to, who's taking the time this afternoon to listen to us and the other speakers speak. And of course, thanks to Private Property for the opportunity. I'm going to share my screen in a second, and I will also be switching off my camera so that my presentation with the graphs is nice and big on your screens. Let me just get the right screen. There we go. Okay, so as Tracy said, um, I will be taking you through what happened in the rental market in the year 2020 and then also chat to you about our survey results. Um, topics I'll be co covering this afternoon is rent, we'll have a look at arrears um, and also credit metrics. For the Western Cape, I'm happy to say all news, almost all news is good news. So let's start it with rent. On a national level, if we look at year-on-year -year rental growth over the last two years, we can see that it trended mostly between 3 and 4% during 2019, and then it started trending downwards in 2020. You can clearly see where lockdown hit, it had a huge effect on the rental market, also on inflation. If you remember, we weren't allowed to buy anything other than groceries. So that obviously affected the price of goods in general. Um, rental growth is also lower than inflation um, for most of the last two years. And here you'll see an, an historic event. In November 2020, we saw the first negative year-on-year -year rental growth since we started the rental index back in 2012. So what that 0.3% means is that from November 2019 to November 2020, the average rental amount decreased by 0.3%. It's not a huge rand amount, but it is an historical event and really worth note, uh, mentioning. Why was the rental market under such pressure during 2020? So there are two sides to the story. Firstly, there's a demand side, and then there's also a supply side. So if we look at the demand side, it really boils down to affordability. I'm sure most of you have tenants who lost their job or lost part of their income or had a partner lose their income. So overall, tenants just weren't able to afford large rental increases. It's also possible that tenants are staying longer in their current property because they 
can't afford to move to larger and more expensive properties. So that um, decrease in demand also uh, decreased the price. Looking on the supply side, two factors I play here. We know of many Airbnb properties that were, because they were standing empty on the short-term rental market uh, due to the travel ban, those owners put them put those properties in the long-term rental market, thereby flooding the market. Secondly, because of the very low interest rates uh, that we are currently experiencing, investors are buying more vital properties and that's also flooding the rental market. So that uh, low demand and high supply, those two factors uh, affect the, the rental market quite a bit. Do we see it changing in the next year? Uh, the short answer is no. Both of these are not very elastic in the short term, meaning they take some time to change. Uh, so we don't expect the rental growth to shoot the lights out for the next year. If we look at the same data just quarterly, we can clearly see that downward trend that I spoke about earlier. At the end of last year, year-on-year -year rental growth, meaning the increase in rent from the last quarter of 2019 to the last quarter of 2020, was only 0.2% or 10 rand. We can clearly see here the effect of lockdown at the end of quarter one, um, between quarter one and quarter two, uh, of 2020 rental growth literally halved. Now, if we compare the Western Cape figures with that, it uh, doesn't paint the best picture. Um, as I mentioned earlier, rental growth for 2019 and, and into 2020 on a national level was between three and 4%, and the Western Cape um, was a bit short of that from the beginning of 2019. Here at the end of 2020, we saw three consecutive quarters of negative rental growth, meaning that year on year, rent is getting a little bit cheaper on average. Putting this into perspective, uh, the Western Cape uh, agents shouldn't be too worried about that negative rental growth. Four other provinces also experienced negative rental growth, with the lowest being 3.3%. The Western Cape is still the most expensive province in the country. Looking at arrears, quite a big topic for 2020, uh, also because many tenants lost their jobs and weren't necessarily able to pay their rent. They might be willing to pay, but they weren't necessarily able to pay. So when we look at arrears, we look at two metrics. First, the percentage of tenants in arrears. And then secondly, we look at what is the average size of arrears relative to rent. So let's start with the first one. At the beginning of 2020, just before lockdowns, so lockdown was announced here, smack bang in the middle of the two uh, quarters, more or less, 19.4% of tenants were in arrears. That means about one in five tenants were in arrears. Then came lockdown and this number jumped to 24.9%. So one in four tenants were in arrears. And I'll explain why we saw this pattern in a bit. From the second quarter, we can see that this figure recovered quite nicely to the end of last year, but ending at 20.9, not quite at the 19.4 level that we saw before lockdown. Looking at average arrears percentage, so at the beginning of last year, a tenant who were in arrears owed, on average, almost 80% of one month's rent. So this is, that is what that 78.5% means. That increased and spiked in the third quarter and then recovered down to 96% in the last quarter. That is quite a way away from the 78 that we saw at the beginning of last year. And this is a more sticky metric than the percentage of tenants in arrears, and I'll explain that in a second. So why did we see the trends that we, that we just saw on that previous slide? For one thing, cash flow, certainty and uncertainty. If you can put yourself in a tenant's shoes, when lockdown was announced, many tenants didn't know when they would be able to go back to work, whether they would re receive a full salary. So 
tenants stopped paying their rent in full because of that uncertainty. Then towards the end of the, the middle of, this, of the second quarter, it was announced that the economy will open and people could return to work on the 1st of June. This is now those who still had their jobs. So tenants started paying their rent in full again and where they could paid off their arrears. If we look at the average arrears percentage, remember this one peaked only in the third quarter. These tenants who went back to work on the 1st of June and were able to pay off their rental arrears, because they left this arrears pool, mathematically the average just spiked a bit in the third quarter. The remaining arrears are quite sticky and difficult to pay off because if you think about it, for, for this figure to, to decrease, a tenant will have to pay their rent in full plus make an additional payment towards their arrears. And in the current economic climate, that is difficult for many tenants to do. If we compare the Western Cape arrears figures with the national, this is a good picture that we see on, on this slide. At the beginning of last year, 15.3% of tenants were in arrears, so one in six. That spiked at 21% in the second quarter and recovered down to 18% in the last quarter. So still higher than at the beginning pre-lockdown, um, but luckily lower than the national average. Looking at the average arrears percentage, it started out really well with very low levels of average um, uh, of an average arrears percentage at below 70%. This also spiked in the third quarter and then recovered to 94%. So that 94% is quite a sticky number, as I said, and it is far off from the 68% uh, mark that we saw pre-lockdown. Then let's briefly look at credit metrics. So before we look at them, these figures come from credit checks done through the pay prop system. So it doesn't necessarily track a specific pool of tenants and what their credit profile looks like. It looks at the tenants who are applying for rent actively. So just keep that in mind when we interpret these stats. So we look at quite a few, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, one that I want to highlight is major delinquencies. So a tenant or a prospective tenant has a major delinquency when they have a notice or a default against their name, or if they had an account in arrears that was more than three months overdue. So at the beginning of last year, 18.4% of tenants or prospective tenants had a major delinquency against the name, which is actually quite high if you think about it. That spiked in the second quarter at 20% and then improved again against um, towards the end of the year back to levels seen in the first quarter. The other one that I want to highlight is the debt to income ratio. We all know that interest rates dropped by three and a half percentage points during um, the year last year, and that's evident in this. You can see at the beginning of the year, tenants spent almost 50%, almost half of their net income, their take-home pay, on debt repayments. And at the end of the year last year, that was only 40%. So that lower in interest rate really had an effect on this. Of course, if they spend less money on debt, they have more money left over at the month, and this is what we're measuring here with disposable income. Credit score summarizes overall uh, tenant health, and it was really good to see that this actually improved during the year. So from the beginning of the year um, at 6.42, and that increased to 6.45 at the end of the year. It is only three points, I know, but it was a bit of a surprise uh, to see that. Now, if we compare the Western Cape statistics to the national, it looks quite green and that's a good thing. So income in the Western Cape is higher than national and it's the highest in the country, the second highest in the country. We can also see that fewer tenants have major delinquencies against their name. So your 
they are more good tenants, if you think about it that way, um, than the, what we see nationally. Tenants also on average spend a smaller percentage of their net income on debt, uh, which means that they have more money left at the end of the month. And then credit score-wise, overall credit health of Western Cape tenants are above the national average, and nine points above the national average, actually, which is quite encouraging. So why did credit metrics improve in 2020? And when I say credit metrics, I mean credit score. Like I said, I didn't really expect to see that increase in credit score um, overall. And there are a few possible reasons for this. So we all know from the news and the radio that in South Africa, lower income consumers, not necessarily tenants, but lower income, in, income consumers were hit a bit harder by lockdown. So they lost more jobs, had more pay cuts, couldn't go to work. So it's possible that these tenants completely exited the, the rental market in the short term, either by moving in with family or uh, sharing a house with another family. It's also possible that tenants could be staying longer uh, because, like I said earlier, affordability makes that they can't necessarily uh, move to a bigger and more expensive property like they normally would. It's also possible, and this is just uh, my hopeful side, but that tenants are financially a bit more responsible after COVID. We all had a bit of a, a, bit of a fright when um, a hard lockdown hit, and I think many people had a to rethink about how they spend their, their money, where they spend it. So it is possible that tenants are just more financially responsible. Also, like I said, the lower interest rates did have an effect on the debt to income ratio. So it's also possible that tenants are actually paying more money on their, or paying off their debt with their extra um, money that they're not spending on um, interest. And then like I said, I was expecting credit metrics to worsen. Um, another reason is that good tenants, because of the low interest rate, um, are actually buying property instead of renting. So I was expecting to see that, that credit score worsen because good tenants are actually leaving the market. It's good to see, though, that there are still good tenants out there. Last but not least, as Tracy promised, um, a sneak peek at our second state of the rental industry survey we conducted at the end of last year and I took a few highlights out of the results that we'll uh, hopefully publish um, in April. So who took part? 95% of the participants works in the property industry. Um, that feels quite logical since we sent it to mostly pay prop users and other industry players whose contact details we have. 69% were either a business owner or a rental agent. And then 64% had smallish rental books, so 150 properties and uh, less. Technology with the year that we had was obviously very topical. This should come as no surprise. 55% of people said they increased the use of technology in their business during COVID. So this is 55% who fully agreed with the statement. There was another 25% who just agreed. So in total, 80% of respondents increased their use of technology during COVID. 70% said that virtual viewings and 3D tours are here to stay. So even if things go back to normal, um, there will still be a place for virtual viewings and 3D tours. And lastly, 69% said that it's more productive to increase automation, so with the use of technology, than to increase the workforce. This is just an example of how people realize that it's better to work smart than to work hard. Looking at the type of movements we saw in portfolios or type of responses, 70% of, of participants said that the rental increases they put through during 2020 was lower than usual. This again goes back to affordability. This was quite a shocking one for me. 93% said that 
they made alternative payment arrangements with tenants during lockdown. So they're at the start of lockdown, which just shows you how many tenants were actually affected um, by job and income losses. 55% said that they have more vacant properties on their books than they normally do. And then 64% said that they lowered their commission income. So this is quite a worrying statistic, purely because commission is a rental agency's main source of income. Once you lower that commission percentage, you basically shoot yourself in the foot over the short term, but also over the long term, because it's very difficult to actually increase that commission percentage um, in the future if you're just doing the same amount of work. Looking at challenges briefly, 51% said that the biggest challenge is finding good tenants. So earlier today, I looked at 2019's results. Um, this was only, finding good tenants was only second in line. First was managing arrears. So it's, it's quite surprising that this jumped over arrears and is now most agents' biggest nightmare. Worries for 2020, most or you know, more than two thirds of respondents said that they are worried about the ongoing effect of COVID on their business. And I'll end with some good news. Last question of the survey was, how optimistic are you about the future of the rental market? Only 5% said negative or pessimistic. 17% said that they feel neutral about it. And an overwhelming 78% said that they are optimistic about the future of the rental market. I compared this statistic to the survey results of 2019. And through lockdown, before we knew that COVID existed, only 62% of people were optimistic about the future of the rental market. So I'm hoping that lockdown and COVID and living through a pandemic made us all think about life a bit differently and um, yeah, made us more optimistic about the future. If you want more information about rental arrears um, and credit metrics, you can download the rental index that's available. I'll drop that link in the chat um, for you just now. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over to Jan. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm talking to Sunny Ellen Bosch, and uh, sorry for the glitch there as we expect. I'm talking to you from a nice and sunny Stellenbosch, and it's lovely to see so many familiar names and even faces on this particular event. So I want to make use of this opportunity of thanking Amasi, Tracy Lee, Ben, Cole, and everybody at Private Property for this wonderful opportunity. Um, Today, I did not prepare nice graphs and a nice presentation for you. Should I have, I would have titled it Death by PowerPoint, because we are going to take a, a look into the future, but unfortunately, it has to be in regard to legislation and regulation. And I particularly want to touch on the legal landscape that awaits us sometime, probably during the course of this year. Now, as you all know, the Property Practitioners Act was promulgated published in the Government Gazette already on 3 October 2019. And with that being the case, some of you may be wondering why we as estate agents are still working in accordance with the Estate Agency Affairs Act of 1976. I think we all agree that this 45 year old piece of legislation is overdue for replacement. As a, this old act dates back to an era before the internet, before digital marketing, before social media, and very importantly, also before automated and integrated payment platforms such as PayProp. The old act simply does not cater for today's realities and we need to see how this is going to change. Now, considering the new Property Practitioners Act, we must remember that this new act, like all other new acts in itself, only sets out the broad principles of the new law, not its implementation. Now that is where the regulations to an act come in, setting out the implementation and the application of the new act. 
Now, although the Property Practitioners Act was published in October 2019 already, its regulations have not been finalized, and only once they are published in the Government Gazette, the new Act will be implemented, and that's when all of us as estate agents need to start being compliant with the new Act and the new regulations. When is that likely to be? We don't know. Um, there's no indication of when we can expect it, but there's a very good indication of what we can expect. So the draft regulations were published for public comment already uh, in March last year. Um, and the, the period for public comments was extended until 20 November last year. And now we await the final regulations, the publication in the Government Gazette that will bring this new act into operation. So sometime during the course of this year, it will be implemented and what can we expect? Like I've said, I'm not going to give you a PowerPoint presentation. What I am going to do is going to share my screen and show you extracts of the act firstly, and then extracts of the regulations. This is public information that is available on the web. You can read it at your own time. Please share that with your auditor. If you need to seek legal advice, kindly share it with your attorney. Follow the webinars that are being presented by industry commentators. And you have probably seen and heard a lot. I'm just going to point out three very salient aspects that are vitally important to rental agencies, property rental agencies. And I'm going to start, and I, can trust, I trust you can all see my screen, I'm going to start with section 54 of the Act that tells us what the intention of the legislature is. Now, it says there in 54.1 that every property practitioner must open and keep one or more separate trust accounts, which must contain certain references. Then every property practitioner must immediately after, after opening a trust account appoint an auditor and then the authority must be notified and the authority ladies and gentlemen is the new name for the EAAB. It, it will have a full name but uh, as estate agents are now becoming property practitioners the EAAB will be referred to as the authority and then there are certain things that you must do in terms of section 54 that deals with your trust account. Subsection 2, 54.2, also says that a property practitioner may invest in a separate saving account certain funds that which are not immediately required for any particular purpose, very similar to section 32.2 of the Estate Agency Affairs Act. And then it goes on with a few things that you must do. And as you know, the Act is also published in an indigenous language. If we scroll down, you will see that there are quite a few things that a property practitioner must do. And then the authority, as in EIB, in other words, they may do certain things, a court may do certain things, and the property, property practitioner must do many other things in terms of Section 4 that deals with trust monies. None of that is new. It, it is pretty similar to Section 32 of the Estate Agency Affairs Act that most of you, all of you are probably familiar with. So section 54 is something that you should read and if, if necessary, obtain legal advice. I'm reiterating that I'm simply pointing out these, um, these important sections. I'm not trying to give you legal advice. But what is very different in the new act and the intention of the legislator, what is very different is when we look for, as an example, at section 23. The heading already is something new. It talks of exemptions in respect of accounting records and trust accounts. We've never had that. When we read section 23, subsection 1, it says that a property practitioner whose turnover is below 2.5 million must cause these her or its accounting records to be subjected to an independent review by a registered accountant subject to the provisions of section 54 that deals with trust monies. Now what is new here is that there's a threshold of 2.5 million it didn't exist before, but a practitioner who's below this threshold must cause his accounting records to be subjected to an independent review by a registered accountant. It's no longer 
a formal trust audit by a chartered accountant and you can see it's prescriptive it's a must so this is new so in the act we see the intention of the legislator and if we take that further in, in um, section 23 2 subsection 2 it says that the minister may by notice in the gazette and that's the government gazette determine the circumstances under which certain property practitioners may be exempted from keeping trust accounts being exempted from trust accounts as estate agents has never been possible before and then also the minister may by notice in the government gazette determine a different dispensation for the review of accounting records for those property practitioners what's different here it's not an audit it's simply a review and it's not by a chartered accountant it's only by a, a registered accountant which means the intention of the legislature here is to make it much cheaper much easier far less onerous and that potentially could be very good news for rental agents who have very active trust accounts so that was the act and the, and the above section 54 and section 23 that we've just read deals with the intention of the legislature. And what is important now is that what we is that we should consider the regulations to see how it's going to be implemented uh, once these regulations are published. Regulation four of the draft regulations that were published last year deals with it and the heading or the the heading says exemption from trust accounts. Now, pursuant to the provisions of the uh, sections that I've just read to you, a property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if that property practitioner has never received any trust monies other than as it permitted in Regulation 4.4, which we will come to. And the property practitioner is also exempted from keeping a trust account if he no longer receives any trust monies other than permitted in Regulation 4.4. So it's clear that there can be exemptions, either if you, have, if, you, if you have never received monies or that you no longer receive trust monies and that you're gonna wind up your old trust account. We will deal with that now. So just the uh, and, it's an and, it's not never all, all these are and, and, and. And the property, uh, in, you can apply for exemption if you submit to the authority an affidavit in the form in terms of which affidavit the property, the property practitioner asserts certain things. So there is an, an, an annexure to these regulations, that is the template that you need to complete as an affidavit in which you assert certain things. And firstly, you will have to say that you are fully compliant with the regulations above, and you will have to give an undertaking that you will not receive any trust funds after the date of your affidavit and then you need to provide evidence to the authority or the EIAB that any previously existing trust account that was operated by you um, is still active and so there must be an independent review of that and then it gets parked. You must provide evidence that, evidence that it's closed, that it has been reviewed, its history no longer active and if that has happened uh, you can be exempted. So in Regulation 4.2, it says where a property practitioner is exempted after you follow all those processes that you must carefully read in your own time, you can be exempted from having a, uh, um, having a trust account. And further, once if you are exempted in terms of the above, you will be exempted from having to have your business accounts audited and you will only be required to have such account independently reviewed by a registered accountant. So this is all the detail that deals with it. And if we get to regulation 4.4, that is a very important sub-regulation for rental agents. It says that a property practitioner will further be exempted. So you can, so it's, if, it's, if you're small and if you have followed small, it means, I mean, uh, less than two and a half million turnover follow these procedures and then further you can be exempted if such property practitioner you as an estate agency has mandated one or more other property practitioners that specialize in collecting and distributing trust payments 
and such other property practitioner will then be referred to as the payment processing agent, such as PayProp, to process such trust payments on its behalf. What is important of 4.4.1 is that if you want to apply for exemption of having to keep a trust account and to have it audited, you must use an accredited payment processing agent, such as PayProp, who also is a property practitioner. Your payment processing agent must be a property practitioner with a valid FFC and it must be compliant with all these regulations as well. And then very importantly, it must also pro process all trust funds received by you as a property practitioner, not some on your own account and some on this account. All trust monies must be processed by your accredited payment processing agent. Considering 4.4.2, you can be exempted if each payment processing agent, like a PayProp mandated by you, operates a trust environment that complies with the Act and the associated regulations. So it's not a single trust account, it's a complete trust environment that has to be managed by the payment processing agent and the further subsections deal with it in more detail. So each payment processing agent, that's your pay prop, mandated by you, the agency, operates within its trust environment, separately auditable client accounts, both in respect of each property practitioner or the state agency to whom the pay props of this world provide such services, and in respect of each client of each such property practitioner. In other words, you must have separate, separately auditable client accounts for each estate agency and within that account of each estate agency, you must have separately auditable accounts for each landlord and each tenant. So there's a big environment, then trust accounts for each agency and then auditable client accounts for each landlord and each tenant. Subsection 4.4.4 says, the trust environment of the payment processor like PayProp and each of the client accounts, in other words, each of the estate agency's accounts operated by the payment processing agents must be audited annually in compliance with the Act and the regulations and the audit reports in respect thereof must be submitted to the authority or the EIAB in compliance with the Act. So in other words, ladies and gentlemen, if you are uh, a small operator, you can apply for exemption. If you have no trust funds in your own account, and if you use an accredited payment service provider that meets all these requirements as per the definitions, and you no longer hold any trust monies whatsoever in your own trust accounts, you can apply for exemption. And there I will show you Annex E1 on page 11 of the regulations, that is the affidavit that you'll have to complete and submit it to the authority after which you will probably have a far less onerous, much less complicated, far cheaper uh, arrangement in terms of uh, payment processors, trust account for your trust monies. I hope that is good news for the smaller operators and the newcomers to the industry. Please make sure that you are familiar with regulation four and those two sections, 54 and 23 of the estate of the property practitioners act and on that note i thank you for listening to me and i will hand back to tracy after i've stopped sharing thank you so much tracy lee thank you so much Jan. thank you for taking us through can you put yourself on mute so that we don't get feedback from the speaker perfect Thank you so much, Jan. Um, we have one question here that's in the Q&A. How many properties on a national level are these statistics based on? And then again, you hit, you answered that question. Nationally, about 110,000 properties are managed through the pay prop system. The Western Cape stats are based on about 30% of that figure. And also you had dropped a link for you to be able to download their latest rental index here. So we are really coming up against the clock right now, and I have two more speakers to bring through to the stage. Let me immediately bring on, yeah, I agree, Dylan. Let's say thank you to your head and Jan. Thank you so much for 
giving us all of those valuable insights, in particular with the particular uh, look at the rental market. Dion, welcome back. Are you back now? I am back. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? <laughs> Thank you, team. I really appreciate it. Sorry about that. No, no problem, Dion. Thank you so much for coming back through. Um, I'm going to ask you to take it away, and then immediately after you, we're going to go to Carl van Berg from the private property family, and he's going to give us a sense of what's going to happen with private property in the next couple of months in, uh, in how they're going to be growing their brand moving forward. But thank you to Jan, and thank you to your head, and over to you, Dion. Thank you, Tracy, and, and thank you, everybody. I'm really excited to be back. Um, this is really a great event, and, and to the private property team, thank you guys. Um, you've just shown your agility, really appreciate it. I, th I think this afternoon I'm going to start off by just taking a quick step back just to see where, where we started a year ago. So, so let's, let's just take a, a step back into history. A year ago this time, the first COVID-19 cases have already been diagnosed in South Africa, and, and, and the new infections were absolutely skyrocketing at, at that stage. Our government um, introduced lockdown measures, which compared to the top 25 strictest regulations in, 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 in the various countries in the world. And, and, and we were absolutely beleaguered by a global pandemic. We touched all of us on an individual, an industry, a country, and, and, and even worldwide. At this stage last year, um, e um, economists actually um, um, said that the contraction in, in our economy will be around about 8.3% with these dreadful numbers that we looked at at, at, at that time. Also, um, just to catch up, in June last year, and, and, and just coming to mind in terms of these numbers, 53% people in South Africa said that their finance had been severely impacted. 35% had experienced a salary cut. 14% have lost their jobs already at that time, and 6% were asked to take unpaid leave. So, so really, lockdown level five last year came into effect, and it actually, us who are sitting here today, um, it almost cost us two months of our lives where we couldn't best. And we had to rethink what is happening in our lives, what is important for us. And, and, and we actually had to, had to rethink around the way we live, the, the, the way we earn a living, and the way we conduct our, our business. So, so, so where are we, where, what does this mean for the property market? Thank you, um, Isti. So, so what, is, what does this mean for the property market? Bearing in mind that we've lost two months of economic um, activity, which was devastating, and um, on, on, on our sales uh, um, um, in, in, 20, in 2020. Um, I think the industry saw this decline in the first half as well. We saw it in terms of the applications that came through and our volumes for the first half of last year actually was 9% down on 2019. In the Western Cape, we were very blessed. We were only 4% down on the 2019 applications in the first, first half. However, the second half, we saw a remarkable recovery. And, and I'm sure each and every one of you has actually felt that that ability and, 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 and agility of the, of the property market to, to rebounds. And our volumes actually grew by 36% in the second half of 2020. In the Western Cape, when we closed the year out, we were up 35% against 20, 2020 and 2019 in terms of our, of our applications. From a ditch office perspective, we, we, we saw this activity translate into registrations very intermittently, at, uh, I must admit that, but, but our second half of the year, we actually doubled our registrations versus the first half, half of the year. And that left us only with an 11% down on the 2020, the 2019 uh, um, um, numbers, um, which we are currently picking up in the, in the first quarter of 2020, 2021. So, so what we saw in the Cape region in 2020 was actually a tale of two halves, a dramatic downturn in the beginning of, 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 of the lockdown, and then that even more dramatic increase that we saw in our applications in the second half of, of, of the year. Very interesting to note as well is that the quality of our customers 
did not deteriorate. And that allowed us to carry on lending. We didn't have to put in specific um, specific uh, milestones to, to, to prevent us from not lending to good customers. We were very happy with the customers that actually came came into um, in, in, into our business in, 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 that, in that part. Thank you, Esti. So, so I, I think it's important after, after understanding this, it, it's important to say, what was our customer saying? We, we, we really unpacked all these, these activities and what was interesting to see is, is the impact this had on all our different regions. Our regions did not, one of them reacted the same. And in some instances, our decisions were absolutely made on weekly and daily horizons. So if you look at the customer sentiment index of, 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 of EPSA, for, for those of you who don't know this as yet, it's a proprietary index which tests customers' confidence in the property market. So if, if we look at, 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 at the numbers, we see that all over, all our provinces actually increased in terms of the sentiment index over this period. And, and, and if you look at the, the end of the year, not only not only only for 2020 that we do good, but we were actually the highest. The sentiment index was the highest it has been since 2015. Overall, we saw a 9% increase in the sentiments towards buying, and interestingly, a 4% increase um, towards selling of, of, of the properties. There, there are mainly four contributors, if we if you look at these, these, these numbers, which resulted in this overall confidence ending the year at, 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 at 80%. So, so on, the, on the demand side, we will, we will see the ability of, of, of property to increase in value over a period. And currently, the low interest rates that is, that is making debt financing just much more um, af affordable to everybody. If you look on the supply side, um, the support has been originated from the, the, the resilience in, in house prices. And, and there was a very strong renewed impetus on ownership of, of, of clients to invest in, 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 in their own properties. I think another point that I, that, that I would just like, like to highlight as well is interesting to also note that, that the, um, the sentiment from the inland provinces increased by 4% and those of the coastal provinces by 6%. And, and I think that should give us some hope, some hope to say what is gonna, what is gonna happen going, going forward. Thank you, Esti. So if we if if we look at the at the three regions and I'm and I'm and I'm in, in those presentations I'm, I'm we we are just going to look at the at the three metros Gauteng, KZN, and Western Cape we can see that overall all the metros actually showed an an increase the biggest increase was in the Western Cape and 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 this could have been due to the semi migration of, of 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 customers who can now basically work from it from from anywhere and they are choosing the lifestyle of of, of working from home versus the convention in, in in the various cities if we are ever um compare that to gauteng we we, we noticed that gauteng by far gave us the um the most new applications during during 2020 so so if you if you compare the western cape sentiments versus the rest of the country we see that on the national in index we actually lack the country by one percent that the sentiment towards buying property at 78 percent matches the national index but it's lagging gauteng and i'm just using gauteng as the benchmark by two 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 percent on on the sentiment towards towards selling the western cape is is lagging the national same sentiments by five percent and Gauteng by 6%. And the last one that stood out for, for, for me to share was actually on buying versus, versus um, renting. The Western Cape lacks the sentiment, the national sentiment by 3% and, and lack Gauteng by 5%. Although all, all these, these um, sentiments are, are positive, they, they is still, there is still a sentiment that, that, that the Cape can do better in 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 terms of of what it what it offers each new and its existing home buyers at, at at the moment so so if if i look at um thanks thanks st if if i look at the homeowner sentiment by customer type we actually saw a very very interesting uh, picture so so first of all we can see that that all the customer types have actually ended up 
um, uh, above the 2019, the end of year 2020, 2019 number. So if all, all those all those um, customer types have picked up to um, to the pre-COVID COVID levels. The two interesting ones is 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 the orange line, and that is our existing homeowners, and then that purple line. Um, which is our our investors. So 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 normally our existing homeowners lack um, all all these sentiment in indexes purely because they have gone through this whole process of of buying and selling a, a property. It's not the first time, and 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 they normally lack. But what was what was great to see here, and what was interesting, is that 10% increase in the last quarter for them to actually end up so strong. Um, towards the end of 2020. If you look at the at the investors, you can actually see that drop of that very strong drop of in the heart of COVID, of the pandemic. You can see that drop off. And 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 what we anticipate or, 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 or what we contribute that that to is purely the, the 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 economic instability that we are currently um, experiencing. Or oh, that was very um, very prominent in that stage, and and also the um, the um, the defaults, the default rates of 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 um, of, of tenants actually was 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 very high on that stage, and 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 we found that um, investors actually took. A, a backstage at that stage to say, let us just sit, let us watch and see, but we'll just look at what happened in the last court quarter again. They actually ended up um, above the first time home buyers who were owned were actually the market that 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 drove the highest part of our activity in 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 2020. Thank you, Esti. So if, if if we look at this buying versus selling sentiment, we will we will see that 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 gap between a willing buyer and willing seller since 2019 is still widening up. Um, if we look at um, the the um, the willing buyer or the or the the sentiments towards buying buying property, we will realize that that it actually reached the pre-COVID numbers in the middle of 2020, and 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 surely that drove. That 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 whole impetus on, on on the market on new sales and and you should have felt that from a from a buyer pers, pers, perspective. Um, if you look at this, the sentiments towards towards selling, um, it still actually has not recovered back to back to the 1919 levels. So so what does it mean? It means that the gap between the, the, the between wanting to sell and wanting to buy, as as I said earlier, is still widening, meaning that there are more willing buyers in the market than willing sellers at the moment. And, and 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 what we've seen is, is is the impact of that is that it's actually upholding the 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 the, the property prices, especially in that in that sweet spot where where, where we found the, the 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 largest part of our um, activity in the 750 to the 1.55 million. But it's placing a lot of uh, pressure on on the stock in in this price price range. And 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 given given what 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 we see at the moment, it, it might actually push the um, the prices of properties up up as well. So in 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 the Western Cape per se, what we've seen is that the average size of a loan application increased by 29 percent since 2019 to just on about 1.33 million at the moment, um, uh, just purely from a from a bank. App, app application point of point of view. Thanks, Esti. So, so what does what does what does the future hold in terms of of of, of interest? I think I think we are we 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 are all on, on on the same page to say that the low interest rate cycle has been the driver of the positive sentiment in the market, and obviously the the coincidental increase in 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 the new property purchases, um, we 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 also we also clear that that the the rate cycle is is very much on 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 the bottom of 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 the cycle and and we these these rates to stay there round about until Q4 in 2021 when 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 we do expect them to gradually rise again but.
I think uh, Dion may be frozen. Let's give him a little minute there. But uh, Nerissa, you're on standby, aren't you? Excellent. So, studio, let's hand over to Nerissa. Fantastic. And you can put from Yes, I am on standby. Also. Okay, I am here. Thanks, thanks, Tracy. Um, sorry, guys, I think Dion is having some technical issues, so uh, I'm just going to quickly step in. So from an interest rate perspective, what we are seeing is that we anticipate that the interest rates will remain favorable. And um, property is actually a huge stim stimulant for the economy. So we anticipate to see interest rates increasing towards the 2023. But for now, I think the rates are going to remain relatively stable. We can move over to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so the house prices. So what we are seeing um, from the house price perspective, we can move on to the next slide, is that the house prices are currently influenced by the demand of property. So there's a lot more buyers in the market at the moment as opposed to sellers. So the willingness of sellers is not as keen as what we are seeing from a buyer perspective. From majority of the applicants are our first time home buyers. So 52% of our applicants are actually made up of your first time home buyers. So we're starting to see the stock levels deplete, but I think it's also important to understand that developments and developers play a huge part in our property industry to ensure that there is a continuous supply of properties and stock. Thank you, you can move to the next slide. Okay, so market growth by, by province. So you would see, and really, I think Dion touched on this, the tail of the two halves, where we started to see um, last year and in 2019, a slight decline in the property market. But what we are seeing from a growth perspective, whilst Western Cape is showing a 2% growth, we, we um, also understand that there's been huge interest, especially with what we call semi-migration, where you don't necessarily have to be in the province where you currently work, especially now with people working from home. And I know when lockdown first started, a lot of people said, do I actually live at work or work from home? So I think it's become that entire balancing your working from home perspective. And a lot of people are migrating towards the coast and Western Cape stats might even change towards the latter part of the year. And we will continue to obviously do these surveys to understand what actually transpires over the year. Um, thanks, you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Okay. So I think also very important for us as APSA is that South Africans have shown their resilience during the pandemic. Um, whilst we gave 3.4 billion rand from a collections capability, especially from a, a payment relief perspective back into the economy to help um, the South Africans, we've also seen that 94% of our South Africans have actually been able to keep up with their repayments after the payment relief holiday. And I think this really shows that South Africans are proud homeowners because owning a home as a South African shows us that we want to build a legacy for our families. And really, a house is not just a house and a building, but it's actually a home where we raise our kids. And I think that shows where South Africans are from a home journey perspective. And we as we thank you in partnering part with us as we aspire to house and shape the industry in a meaningful way. And I thank you for being part of that homeowner journey and really for making jeans. Thank you, Nerissa. Thank you so Thank you. much. Please put your microphone on mute so that we don't get feedback. I see you also, your network is also dropping a little bit there. You can see the bars on the corner of your screen, uh, just two of the four bars lighting up. Can I say, can I see from the chat who's still here with us? Did you enjoy Dion and Nerissa's uh, presentation? 
Thank you, Estelle. I see you're still with us. Your head, you're still here. Michaela, Louise, thank you for that. Very informative. Martin, Marie, Dante, good presentation. Marinda, Arnold, Alta, Susanne, Amal Fidela, thank you so, so much. Nerissa, I don't see any questions specifically aimed at, um, at your session or at your talk. Just reminding everyone that if they do need to reach out to you or anyone from your team, they are more, more than welcome to just hit you up directly on the participants button here and uh, send you a message uh, directly. Maybe Dion or someone from Dion's team can pop his email into the chat if anyone has any questions that they want to ask directly to, uh, to you guys. So Narissa, thank you so much for being on standby and taking the, taking the baton from uh, Dion and helping us just smooth over that little bit of a technical glitch there. I will excuse you from the stage. You can get back on the in the limo and uh, drive all the way back to Johannesburg. <laughs> okay, so who's still here with us in the room? We're at the end, almost at the end of our session. We have one more person to bring up. Uh, can I see you use your emojis? Give me one emoji that uh, illustrates or demonstrates exactly how you feel right now. Curtis Dillon, I'm still here. Big smile on your face. We see you. Great tag teamwork. Apps. I agree, Zintle. They did a great, great job. Erhard, thank you so much. Very useful information. Marie, that's a lovely smile I see there. Louise, awesome. Studio, let's get the private property um, people ready to come on next. Finally, I'd like to welcome Private Properties Business Development Executive, Carl Funnable. Some of you may have met him in the past. Some of you may meet him now for the first time. It's always a privilege for me to listen to him. Carl is going to give us a glimpse into what the future holds for this brand and what true industry partnership might look like going forward. And of course, before I hand over to you, Carl, I asked a question right at the beginning. I said, why is it a really special day for us today at Private Property? Of course, a year ago today, on the 17th of March 2020, a week before lockdown, we decided to change everything about ourselves, especially starting with our logo and our colors and just our voice um, in, in terms of brand. And so this is what's really special about today for us. And thank you guys for being here for that. Carl, please enlighten us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tracy, and uh, thank you so much to everybody from Cape Town that's joining us today. Um, it's really good to see that a big bank like EPSA is actually quite agile and can think on their feet and they've got a plan B. I hope uh, my network holds. I had problems with it on Monday, so I feel EPSA's pain. But again, it's an absolute privilege for us to actually spend some time with you guys today. Um, we're obviously a business that's been built around relationships. And uh, something that we're really good at is the, the physical ones, you know, having a cup of coffee with our clients sharing some thoughts, sharing some understanding and, and knowledge. And, you know, COVID has obviously taken that away from all of us. So we're really, really happy that we found this platform and it's a great way for us to really engage with, with everybody out there. So thank you again for, for putting some time aside. And I really, I've seen from the comments here that everyone's thoroughly enjoying it. So thank you very much. Let's kick in. So I'm going to spend a bit of time just talking around what is Pilot Property now? Where are we going? What does that hold for yourselves as clients? Um, and then I'll bring Felina in, who's our provincial head, and she'll just talk around some of the, the stats that mean something to you in your area, just some knowledge that we've picked up through what our consumer's behavior is on our portal. So first and foremost, who are we? So we, we trust it. We, we're choosing to become a trusted partner in the property industry. So, you know, essentially what that means is we find ourselves in the center of the ecosystem to do anything with property. We've got consumers that are coming for properties. Well, we've got real estate agents, we've got banks, we've got developers, we've got mortgage origination, and we really are in the center of it. And Nexus is an amazing uh, example of how it is that we, we sort of operate every day, is we find ourselves in the center and we're using our relationships with our partners to come in and, and inform all of us. And so if we have a much better understanding, we are better equipped to be much better property professionals. So that's really what it is that private property is. We're in the center of this ecosystem. When you start breaking it down, we've sort of got two areas that we really, really focus on. The one on the one side is our consumers, 
And we would classify a consumer as somebody that is buying property, looking for property, wanting to rent a landlord, whatever that might be on the one side. On the other side is yourselves as real estate professionals, as banks, as partners, and, and the rest of it. Now, when you're in the center, you, you're sort of walking a bit of a tightrope sometimes because if you listen too much to the one side, so as an example, if we, if we listen to all of the needs of, let's say, real estate, we run the risk of alienating a possible 57 million users um, that or uh, users that come onto our portal. Very much the same thing is true on the other side. If we listen too much to the consumers and what it is that they want or need, we run the risk of absolutely alienating ourselves as our, as our partners. So it's a bit of a tightrope, but we walk it very, very well. And uh, something that we, we absolutely don't shy away from. If we start looking at how is it that we are going to get to become these trusted partners, it really, really starts with being completely, completely customer obsessed. And again, customers, it's our clients, it's our consumers, it's end users, it's everybody. If we understand and we completely with what it is that our consumers are going through, what it is that our clients are going through, what pain points do we have, what efficiencies are needed in both the business, as individuals, or as, as big corporates. Once we understand those needs, we then get to the problem solving. And we choose, we're choosing to really start solving people's real problems. And we're using digital technology to do that going forward. Once you've got that complete customer obsession and understanding and you start solving these real problems, that's when the exciting stuff happens. And that's where you can start creating some serious value propositions. And this is a long journey, but it's something that we are, are adamant that we're going to be doing for everybody in our ecosystem. Again, as an example, in one of our nexuses earlier on in the week, somebody was saying that, you know, one of their pain points that they would like to see change in real estate was, you know, proper vetting of people before they put an offer to purchase in. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a true thought in our minds to go, you know, can you imagine a world where if you get a lead from somebody that goes, listen, I want to go and have a look at that property. And when we give you that information as a lead, we can say to you, this person has been pre-approved by ABSA. This person wants a three bedroom, two bathroom place in a specific area. They have 2.5 children. These are their ages. They have a cat and a dog. That, that knowledge and that wealth of information is really what we need to start working at. And that's, again, where the magic starts happening and where we start creating some serious customer and client value propositions. Um, let me spend a bit of time talking around where we are in our five-year strategy. So 2019 was our year of preparation. We got a new CEO in Amasi, and he's brought in a whole new crowd, including myself. And so 2019, we sat there and we, we looked at the business, we looked at our history, and we went, where do we need to be uh, and, you know, in five years' time? So 2019 was really around thinking around what it is that we need to do for this business. 2020 was our foundation year, and I'll speak a little bit more about that later on. This year, 2021, is our watershed moment. This is the year for innovation. This is the year for, uh, for technology. And this is the year for making some serious changes to our business. 2022 is repositioning, 23 optimization, and 24 is really around scaling. You know, once you've got the proper market share, you've got the right balance of consumers coming in, you can really start giving value to everybody in that ecosystem. So if, and I'm sure everybody noticed, and Tracy's been talking about it, but a year ago, we were these blue, red, and white colors. I don't even remember being those colors. We're now this vibrant green. So a little bit of time on this. This is not just a mere brand refresh. This is not just a mere changing a color of a brand. This marks a fundamental change in our business. It marks a fundamental change on what we look like, who we are, how we engage, how we speak to our consumers and how what products and services we give to our clients. It's an absolute change. So we're a 22 year old business. Not everybody knows that, but we are we're 22 years old. As far as we're concerned, we're one years old and today marks that one year uh, birthday for us as a new business and something that's going to take us all really into the future at, at pace. So we're in 2021. We, you know, at the end of this five year strategy of ours, we wanted to have 5 million unique users that come onto our portal every single month and look for your properties. Where are we? Well, we're averaging at around 3.2 million every single month. These are unique people coming onto our portal. 12 months ago, it's a, it actually equates to a million new people every month compared to 12 months ago. And if we compare it to two years ago, we've grown, grown by well over 2 million unique people a month. That is staggering growth. We're exceptionally proud of it. You know, everybody we speak to, um, it says to us, you know, they, there's a tangible difference, not only in our brand, but they can see the value finally that we, we are providing. So again, 
very, very proud of it. We are ahead of where we expect it to be this time of the year. Um, so really great things coming and some serious growth coming, particularly in the second half of this year. So let's talk around sort of the, the topic really, which is around evolution of technology. And, you know, we talk around fintechs and we speak around uh, prop techs. So it's really technology that enables financial transactions and property transactions. So before you start getting into that, you need to understand what are we, where's, what digital environment are we in? Are we in an evolution or are we in a revolution? So again, as an example, if you take our good old Nokia 2110s, and you hold it up against our uh, iPhone 12s that we have at the moment. You just look at those two there. You would seem that to be as an absolute revolution in technology. I mean, they're talking cheese. The one could barely dial, uh, dial and barely send SMSs. Now the iPhone can do a whole range of things. However, that's probably over 20 years ago. So if you chart it out, it's actually an evolution. And it's quite slow over a 20-year period. An example of a revolution we've all actually gone through. 12 months ago, I used to be sitting in our beautiful Amschlanger offices in KZN with 180 degree sea views. Now I'm working from my, my home office. I am waiting for my kids to come running through the door. I do hear that they've just gotten home. So they'll probably be joining us pretty soon and telling me that they're hungry or something along those lines. But this is something that we've all gone through and it happened in a flash. We all had to evolve to this thing. And that's an, a really good example of an absolute revolution. None of us knew, or many of us didn't know about Teams and Zoom and Hangouts. None of us had experienced this Remo platform 12 months ago. But this is all very much part of our lives. So as much as we've changed and we've had this revolutionary moment, we need to be mindful that the consumers out there, and those are the people that are buying and renting and vandals and the rest of them, have gone through the same revolution. They, look, they completely have changed the way that they shop and they search for information on properties. And you, in your head's uh, presentation earlier on, she mentioned the value around uh, virtual reality on you know, the tours on properties. That and the likes of Matterport and the rest that are game changers. Consumers are wanting to get proper information. They want to be properly equipped before they make the plunge around coming through and seeing the actual property. Um, you know, and, and that's a good thing for real estate. It's no longer around, you know, getting how many leads is this. It's around the quality. So if we can use digital technology to start really separating those buyers from the shoppers, I think it'll bode well for all of us in industry. I mean, I can only imagine the day in the life of a real estate agent where you really, you've got your soul mandate, you go put it onto the property portals, and you inundated with two, three, four, five hundred leads in a day. How are you ever going to sift through that uh, effectively? Well, you're not going to be able to really without the aid of technology. So our role as private property is to make sure that we're equipped with this changing behaviors of consumers and make sure that you guys are, have that, that equipment and have that efficiencies to be able to deal with these changing times. So onto that, you're going to start seeing some changes in our environment in a couple of months' time, and we'll spend a lot of time talking to everybody. There's a significant amount of change management that we're going to do but we're going to be essentially building we've halfway through building brand new platforms so there's two platforms that we, we will be going live with in the next couple of months one is a consumer focused one so that really talks to around uh, the ease of a consumer to find your properties us being able to understand the consumer and their needs a lot better it'll be obviously web-based and app-based and the other side is going to be a brand new thing for yourselves as real estate and our clients to be able to interact with us be able to gather, uh, gather information, to gather data, to understand what is your market share in the Western Cape or in your specific in Bergville or whatever it might be. Understand your market share, understand your leads. Where are those leads coming from? Where are the target market? Are there people moving from Weinberg to Hart Bay, whatever it might be? But that's the level of, of data that we're wanting to be able to start uh, providing to yourselves as clients. So it's a big shift. There's uh, some serious things that we're going to be changing in the next couple of months, but again, we will ease you through it and we'll, we'll talk quite well through it. But again, it talks around making sure that we understand yourselves and your needs, make sure that we give you those solutions and really just make your lives a lot more efficient. So we really are looking forward to this. This has been probably 14, 15 months in the making that we've been working on this. And we really are around the corner from making some fundamental changes to how it is that we engage with you. Just in terms of my final slide here, we talk around sort of um, when it comes to digital evolution or revolution, we start talking around this um, disruption. Now, disruptions grow in a bit of a negative connotation. So, you know, a lot of people, especially in our industry, 
when we talk around, you know, we're going to use digital to disrupt, people go, okay, that well must mean that they're going to cut out the middleman. You know, what about me as the agent? They're going to link buyers to sellers directly. It really isn't that. When we talk around digital disruption, we're talking about disrupting the status quo around how does that we interact, how we pass information around. This much we know in South Africa. Property ownership is highly emotive. There is probably the single biggest purchase that anybody in South Africa is ever going to make. There is a human being that is buying. There is a human being that is selling. And there's a human being that is the, the agent, the attorney, even the bank. And it's around how do we enhance these digital experiences that they're very, very human and really just connect people. So we're very, very excited. Again, thank you to, to everybody for joining us today. Uh, all the technical glitches and all. Um, we'll come back on if there's any further questions, but again, we'll be sharing all of this information over the next couple of months with you guys. So again, thank you very much, and um, I will get into my limo, Tracy, and uh, allow Colleen to come on. Thank you so much, Carl. We are definitely at the very end of our talk now, but I know this part is very, very interesting for, for the attendees, which is a real sort of digging drilling down deeper into these areas, Greater Cape Town, Boerland, Helderberg, Overberg, and West Coast. What are we seeing in these areas? What's happening in these areas? Hi, Feline. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you, Carl. And thank you to everyone that has dialed into today's session. Um, I earlier mentioned as well that us Cape Townians don't only fancy our beautiful mountains and Cape Winelands, but we also do love a good get together. And um, I, for one, always at the, at the actual events in our past lives, mentioned that it always feels like a little bit of a family reunion. Today we'll have to be without the hugs and wine though. So um, I do look forward to a time when uh, we can engage like that once again, and I believe that it will come. However, for today, let's focus on the here and now and um, look towards what 2020 brought and brought us from an industry perspective. For private property, um, it's always been very, very important. Um, and we believe that the knowledge um, that we share empowers and equips the property shoppers that frequent our website. Um, those are, of course, our consumers, the feet and the eyeballs coming to the website that turn into your buyers and um, to make the best property buying decisions, right? So, however, we do believe the same can be said for the property professionals that um, also obviously use our portal. And for the purpose of today's presentation, as mentioned by Tracy earlier, um, it was important for me to share area specific and relevant information with you with regards to the greater Cape Town area. Obviously very aware of the time constraints that we have. I've tried to keep it to the point, but I think the point of course being that there's a large, very targeted audience out there looking, searching, and most importantly, inquiring about these properties, people with property needs that you can attend to. So because these markets within the area so greatly differ, um, we've broken them down into the four, uh, four following areas, being Boerland, which is all the way Ceres to Paul, all the way around to Franschhoek, Worcester, Robertson to the lovely town of Barrydale, that has recently stole my heart, and then um, Toes River to Kalainsburg, and then of course the gem called Stellenbosch. Then the Helderberg area, inclusive of Somerset West Strand and Gordon's Bay, and then the Overberg starting at Strays Bar, working its way back to Agalas, housed by Hermanus, Plainmont, Betty's Bar all the way, and then of course Swellen, uh, Swellen Dam inland back to Frapo. And then the West Coast, Atlantic Atlantis, Aether Fontaine and Grotto Bay, Fredenburg, um, and that's all on the screen there, all the way back inland to Clan William van Reinsdorf, back into the Rubik Valley. So I'll try my utmost best not to bore you or kill you by PowerPoint, as Jan earlier said. However, I believe that these stats are relevant to you and would be interesting to you based on where you've tuned in from today. So firstly, taking a look at the Boerland. Now, for each of these areas, I've given you an indication of growth or decline sadly, um, in terms of search activity, but also very importantly of the lead generation that has taken place in these areas. So starting with Boerland, showing a significant increase, especially if we look at the views from 2019 into 2020, 
Um, for both sales, views, and leads, 24% increase in 2019 in terms of leads, followed by a further 35%. And then the rentals also showing significant growth. What is interesting to note here, considering what we've heard about the rental market and having been in the Nexus seminars over the past couple of days and having prepared this presentation, I can say that the fact that the rental leads remain steady at the same level as 2019 is quite a rare phenomenon at the moment. Rental lead increases are few and far between. So that is interesting for Boiland. Moving on to the Helderberg area and the towns of Somerset, West Strand and Gordon, Spain. Interestingly, um, the most growth in terms of sales, views and leads didn't take place in 2019, but rather in 2020. Um, which is interesting for us and has grown by 58 and 20 percent respectively on the sales side. Then in the rentals, 25 percent growth in terms of views. And then there is that slight drop back into 2020 when it comes to rental leads, which makes me think of the saying that someone that has figured out that taking a small step back after taking a big step forward is not an absolute disaster but rather we should think of it like a cha-cha. So I suppose this has been the dance with COVID and its impact it's had on the rental industry at large. Moving on to Overberg, once again, seeing a larger portion of growth in sales views and leads um, in 2020, which is very encouraging. And then from a rental perspective, and yes, I did double check those figures. Um, the rental views and leads for the Overberg area increasing, it increased by leaps and bounds in 2019. Um, and then a further increase, once again, really, uh, positive rental growth there by 6% in 2020, which is very interesting indeed. And then finally, the West Coast. Now we are aware that the West Coast plays host to many and from a sales views and leads perspective, it definitely shows with an 84% increase for sales leads well, 2019 and a further 41% increase of sales leads in 2020. Um, rentals, on the other hand, again, shooting the lights out with a 151% in sales increase, oh, sorry, rental views in 2019, further 28% in 2020, and um, same in terms of leads with a positive rental growth once again. Moving on to the top search suburbs, firstly looking at the Western Cape as a province and then drilling down into the four areas that we've discussed. For sales only, I might add, um, if you are keen to see the rental suburbs, please do let me know. I'm happy to share the information one-on-one -on -one afterwards. So looking at this slide, what is very interesting here is that we see Mitchell's Plain at the very top of the search results here with an average of 320 odd sales listings showcased in that area at any given time. And by looking at these suburbs versus the list a year or two ago, and it's always so interesting, I find it completely fascinating to keep an eye on these entrants. Um, it's our view that there's a complete new set of browsers coming to the site. A market looking for properties just below the 1 million mark probably first time home buyers hungry for information and knowledge about how they can find their first dream home. At present, a mostly untapped market, and I always want to say hashtag opportunity here. Then looking at the other entrants here, Constantia, Seapoint, Claremont, Camps Bay, also high in demand, but then again, who wouldn't want to live close to the serene beaches, not to mention our beautiful mountain. And then moving down the list, beautiful table view remaining on the list as always, bringing along its friend Parklands North, the Cool Kids Circle, and then Grassy Park, Pottery and Retreat also there. I also spotted Dana Bai there in the beautiful garden route. So yeah, quite interesting what we learn from these results. Then moving on to the area perspective, um, I have noted the top 25 searched sales suburbs here for Boerland, um, Paul, a very old favorite, like followed by Wellington and Stellenbosch, where the students get to live in daddy's latest purchase often. 
uh, and followed by the ever increasing popular Valdivia estate where we see a lot of action happening. Helderberg, Strand, Gordons Bay, Somerset West, those are the central areas taking quite a bit of, of space there. In the Overberg, it seems Claymont has something to go in search of. Um, and that's taking the top spot over there, followed by Swellendam and Strays Bar. And finally, the heart of the Swartland, Marmesbury being number one in the West Coast list, and then followed by Azerfontaine and Fredenburg. And then moving on to my last slide, that speaks to the median price in the Western Cape. So now before we look at the data, though, I'd like to remind you of two things. Well, firstly, let's talk about what is a median. A median price is the middle point for real estate prices. It is not the same as an average, though. So the median price is the price in the very middle of a data set with exactly half of the houses priced for less and the other half priced for more. Secondly, kindly note, this is obviously listing price as it is displayed on the portal and not the final selling price as we are not tied into that information at the moment. So with no surprises here, the Western Cape on average are about 30% higher than the national sales median on sales. I said sales. <laughs> Did you hear that? Sales. And 28% higher than the national rental median. So it looks like everybody wants to live in Cape Town and they'll pay for doing for wanting to do so. Also interesting to note on the sales side, um, when looking at the median for February 2020 and comparing it to last month, there's a mere 3% drop in the price median. Whereas on the rental side, we notice a 9% decrease in the medium for last year, February, and uh, probably listening to you hit earlier, giving great insights with regards to the drop um, in her presentation. Also, like she mentioned, probably right sizing from the landlord side, especially in Cape Town. All right. And that is it. Um, it's all I have for you that I'd like to share today. However, I would really like to extend an open invitation to anyone who would like to engage with us afterwards. I will pop my details into the chat just now. My team and I will gladly set up um, meetings to answer any questions that you may have with regards to your particular area. Deirdre and Louise will um, have also joined us today. Carrie Lee is unfortunately not able to but um, we, we look forward to those invitations. Thank you. Back to you, Tracy. Thank you so much, Feline. Awesome stuff. Um, I'm looking in the chat and I don't see any questions for you or for Carl, just lots of smiley faces and uh, sort of thank yous and things like that. Feline, please put your email address in the chat so that anyone wanting to reach out to you is able to do so. And a big wave and a green heart from me to you. Have a lovely day. You can jump in your limo, Miss Feline, and go back to <laughs> your sunny, sunny, sunny spot over there. It's really actually still quite chilly and overcast here in Johannesburg, which I think probably also contributed to some of our technical glitches. But I must say a big, big thank you to the team. Um, thank you to to studio, thank you to the APSA team for your agility. Before I let you go, we're going to pop the link. There we go. Louise Berger, you are on top of things today. There we go. There's the link for you to click on if you want to access those uh, CPD points, one and a half non-verifiable CPD points on offer from AISA. Heta Strauss, thank you so, so much. And then I did promise to uh, give or oh, the best question, <clears throat> pardon me, and also for the most engaged, and I have those names for you. So for this session, best engagement goes to Estelle Smith. Let's do a, a warm, well, well done Estelle, congratulations. And then best question goes to Dylan Emmett. Thank you both to Dylan and to Estelle. And just, I must say, for the, the previous session we had for also the Cape Town region, I forgot to mention the names of the winners there. And I think I, I can quickly mention their names here. 
so that uh, we have it noted down somewhere. Best question goes to Mark Wilson, and best engagement goes to somebody with the name of Ross Taylor. All right, I think that's it from my side. What a day. It concludes our, our, our session for today. Huge, huge thank you to APSA and PayProp for sharing their knowledge with us and their insights with us. Thank you as well to my colleague, Carl, and also my colleague, Feline, for sharing your regional specific insights. And Carl, just painting the picture for the brand for the next couple of months and what we have look, to look forward to. While the session is over, we still have 24 minutes in this portal, which you are welcome to stick around for. You can um, chat with your friends or just move around the, the various tables and go and speak to either the colleagues from PayProp, from APSA or from private property. But um, from my side, if you don't already subscribe to our industry newsletter, please do studio if you could just drop that link for people to subscribe to the industry newsletter is jam packed full of information and also lots of information about when we're going to be doing events like these again if you enjoyed the session can i see you saying thank you and goodbye on the chat here i'm gonna head out now thank you curtis thank you mandy <clears throat> Thank you, Ronal, for that compliment. Great session. It's great because you are here. We appreciate you so much, Keith. Thank you, Janine, Louise, Marinda, Alta, Bye, Danke, Alta. Bye, Danke, Terry. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you, Feline. Thank you to you and your team, of course. And thank you, Deirdre. Thank you, Heta. Thank you, Natalie. Have yourselves a wonderful Wednesday afternoon. Like Jan said earlier, it's Klein Saturday. So go out there and enjoy your clean Saturday. Until we see you again, goodbye.